Welcome on to a long-awaited podcast. We actually have a real draft expert instead of me and Danny who just play uh, at it uh, one month per year. Mike Schmitz, uh, now of ESPN, uh, kind enough to give us his time despite his increased responsibilities. How are you doing, man? I'm great, man. Thanks for having me. So what's uh, your role going to be during the ESPN draft coverage this year? Yeah, so I'm going to be on set, uh, not on the main set, but kind of off to the side, um, talk about some international guys, you know, Luka Doncic, uh, some college guys. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll be involved with the with the main show in, in some capacity. And then um, we have a couple shows coming up here tomorrow. Uh, I think we're going to do a preview show as well, um, closer to the draft. So yeah, it'll it'll be really good. All right. Well, it's been awesome to watch your uh, meteoric rise. You were, uh, you're a natural on that. Uh, going back to those Yahoo ones, like it was like, it's the first time I'd seen you do anything live on camera and you were like awesome uh, on those Yahoo live shows. So looking forward to uh, to seeing you uh, on the draft coverage. Um, so I, let's just start real easily here. In your opinion, who should be the number one pick in this draft? I think DeAndre Ayton, but it, it's something I've gone back and forth with, with him and, and Doncic. Um really all year long. Uh, but to me, it's Aiton. I, I just feel like he has the fewest question marks to me. Um, obviously, watching the playoffs and watching the way the game, the best teams are playing the game now, that's that's probably my biggest question is like, okay, how many 260-pound guys, you know, are even playing on the floor right now? Um, but I do think, you know, he played out of position at Arizona, playing mostly the four. I do think he can improve as a rim protector. I think he has the agility to switch Um, maybe he's not going to be elite at it, but I don't think like you have to drop him every time. And I mean, he's just, I I give him credit. He's improved so much over the last couple of years. Um, you know, I, I don't think anyone saw him. People saw him as a first overall potential talent, but, um, I mean, he wasn't shooting the ball like this or passing the ball like this or, um, doing some of the things he did at Arizona. So, uh, to me, he's the number one guy, but it's, I think, I, I think it's wide open to be honest in terms of who's going to be the best player. And uh, I, the one I've struggled with most is, is him or Doncic. Yeah, I haven't quite done my draft but I, or my draft war, but I think I would probably have Doncic number one at, at this point. But I, I think with both him and Aiton, and Aiton in particular, that for me, you know, his recognition issues, and maybe I am more concerned with those than you are. I mean, where is he right now as a defensive player? And you know, with the relatively low block rate, pretty low steal rate, uh, what makes you believe that he is going to be able to improve defensively uh, at the NBA level? Yeah, he, you know, he's never really been coached. I mean, this is the first year he's ever been coached uh, with Sean Miller. And again, he, you know, him playing the four was really by design. I mean, you know how this works. When these guys come in, they say, hey, yeah, I'm sure. coming here as long as you play me at the four. You know what I mean? So I don't have a ton of sympathy for him there, but uh, he's just he's not a scouting report guy you know he's never really valued those things um and i i think he's a good enough kid and he wants to be good badly enough to where w- once he's in an nba environment he's playing the five um and you know he, he's i just i think he has the tools at least to get better there i don't think he was as bad as as it was made out to be at times this year like I thought he actually did a pretty good job at times, like getting out to shooters or, or switching yeah. on the perimeter or guarding fours. It's more so the rim protection stuff. Um, and, you know, maybe it's projecting too much to say, you know, you hope he's going to get better because he has a seven five wingspan and he's quick off his feet. Um, but I do think like we haven't seen the best of him yet in that regard, just because he's never been coached. He's never studied it. And, um, you know, he's not a big time worker, but I, I do think he can improve there. So is it more at this point in time that he doesn't get into position often enough or that when he is there, he's not really affecting shots as much as you would hope? I kind of think, I mean, there are so many times this year where he's right there, you know what I mean? And he just doesn't yeah. make a play at the ball. And even dating back to high school and, you know, seeing him early on, that he just he never identified himself as a shot blocker you know that's not who he was um and so I think it's gonna take time and reps and film study for him to uh you know do that like his you know his instincts aren't great but I I do think they're better than a guy like you know Marvin Bagley um 
So I, I think he can improve there. It, like it's just it's frustrating to watch when so many times he's in position and he just doesn't make a play of the ball. Do you see him becoming a dominating offensive player? Because this was my thinking on him, and again, I, I'm a little bit less sanguine about his ability to improve defensively in the pros. But you know, let's say he ends up as kind of an average to slightly above average defensive center. If if we grant that. To be the number one overall pick, I think he's got to be an absolutely dominating offensive player. What is his path to getting there? Yeah, um, I think the fact that he's going to, you know, that you, you hope that he's going to be able to space it out to NBA three pretty consistently at a good rate. And then I think you hope he's going to be able to kill switches and then pass out of the post. I think that's something that's encouraged me. You know, he I think he finished the year with more turnovers and assists, but watching him play, his passing is something that I think is really, really underrated. Uh, they had almost no spacing. They played, you know, two traditional bigs, um, and they, their guard play was not very good at all. And he was still able to produce the way that he did. Um, so I think he's a guy, you know, as much as you don't want to just dump it down to guys nowadays, I think he's a guy you can pick and pop. I think you can short roll him because he can make that mid range or he can kick out to shooters from there. Um, and then you can uh, he can operate on the block, you know. But again, I, <laughs> every time I I go through these questions myself as well, I kind of question like, man, why, why do I have this guy <laughs> number one? Um, because he does have a tendency to, you know, he wants to face you up from the mid post and shoot mid range jumpers. Um, so I think you kind of have to coach him out of that. But uh, to to me, I think he's a guy who's going to be able to pop to three. He's going to be able to beat switches, and he's going to be able to pass. Um, I I just I, I wish he was a little bit better as like a roller vertical spacer type of guy yeah you know what my comment when danny and i looked at him was that i I kind of wanted to fit him into these boxes of okay super talented maybe a little under motivated maybe not that skilled maybe not that smart a player but you can't really do that with him like the passing was one example i agree with you that he showed a lot of flashes there you know finding shooters uh, on the weak side that I thought when he did run the floor, it was just breathtaking the type of speed that he had uh, when he was able to get good post position and then just the production as well. I mean, this is not like a guy who is, is un- unable to score. I mean, he's putting up 20 and 10, he's playing a ton of minutes and, you know, he's able to create shots despite and be productive despite the fact that, you know, they didn't really have a ton of spacing or, or system around him. So it's really difficult to ignore that type of production. Yeah, for sure. I mean, just the way he moves at that size is is ridiculous. And so much of, so much of it is natural. You know what I mean? Like I said, like he'd never really been pushed. He never been coached up until this year. So I think that's what gets you excited about this guy is, OK, he just gave you 20 and 10 on, you know, a major college program. Um, with, you know, pretty much just by God given talent. Um, so I think that's, that's what makes you excited about him. Um, but you know, there are, there are definitely I, like, to me, it's, it's so open in terms of who's going to be the best player out of this draft. I just, I feel like he has along with Doncic among the bigs, one of the few, you know, some of the fewest question marks. And like for a guy who people say is low motor and this and that, like, I don't I don't see that as much as other people like he he's a big personality. Yeah, like he's a big personality. He he wants to be good. He has a like an energy about him. He just there are certain things he doesn't want to do yet. You know, he doesn't he doesn't he's not like a mopey lazy guy. Like sometimes you watch Bamba and you and you like you're like, "Okay, like when are you going to show up?" You know? Um, and I don't see that as much with him. Who do you overall think has the highest upside of any player in this draft? Uh, I mean, physically, I think it's Mo in terms of just a guy with measurements we've never seen who could potentially be like a switch everything, block everything, shoot a high percentage from three. You know, people point to his assist numbers, um, and, and I think that's fair for sure. I do think the fact that he's an intelligent human being is going to help him in that regard. Um, And, and he's going to understand those things. Like, like a lot of times with guys who can't pass or can't think on the court, you know, it it seems to, to be evident in other areas of life as well. I think for him, he's just not that experienced. Um, So, yeah, I mean, if everything hit with him, uh, I think he has as much upside and, and you you could, you could put Luca in there too. I think Um, that's kind of an untraditional one. But just with the game, the way the game is played now, 
uh, I think he's in the conversation for that also. No, I, I think so. And this is something I wanted to, to bring up too. Actually, you know, here, I'll do a quick read first uh, and then uh, we'll be right back with Mike talk about obviously the rest of the guys in the top 10, get some of his sleepers, let him take a, a victory lap for uh, Donovan Mitchell's uh, that pick last year. Uh, right after this so it's been during this draft process a lot of late night film sessions for me so i've been crashing pretty hard and when i do it's on my helix sleep mattress they developed this working with the world's leading sleep experts it's not one size fits all one size fits all in my opinion doesn't work i got one of those mattresses before i i found helix sleep didn't work for me didn't work for my fiance we both actually started getting back pain after sleeping on it with helix sleep you can get a mattress that is customized to your height your weight your sleep preferences so you can have the best sleep of your life at an unbeatable price so you go to helixsleep.com and fill out their two minute sleep quiz super short and they'll design your custom mattress if you have a partner that has different preferences than you they can even customize each side of it for you they also now have this helix pillow which i i've been sleeping on the pillows are adjustable they have these inserts so if you're a stomach sleeper you can get a little thinner pillow side sleeper get a little bit thicker pillow so you don't get like your neck kind of turning sideways when you have too thin of a pillow and you're sleeping on your side or if you're a back sleeper like me you can kind of go medium and with helix sleep you get 100 nights to try out their products so it's basically risk-free and far less expensive than an equivalent mattress. This is the best mattress that I have ever slept on. The way to get started with them, helixsleep.com slash capspace is that URL. Remember slash capspace? We talk about capspace all the time here on the program. Helixsleep.com slash capspace will get you up to $125 towards your mattress order. Once again, that's helixsleep.com slash capspace gets you up to $125 towards your mattress order. Helixsleep.com slash capspace. Let them know that you came from us with that slash capspace URL. All right, so we're back with Mike Schmitz here, and we're talking about who has the highest upside in the draft. To me, I think there's three names that that are the highest upside, and a lot of that is based on just the modern game in particular. That I just I, I don't believe at this point that centers can have as high an upside as perimeter players. If you just go back and look, I. I apologize for this i said the last really top five player in the league who was a traditional big was Shaq. that probably actually was dwight howard i i skipped him but really you know if you look at the top three in mvp voting even top five in mvp voting uh and you know when we're not talking about a terrible vote like joe kim noah in 2014 big just don't appear there so it's just really hard for me to see a big as having the upside and then I, i'm sure you read this piece from your colleague kevin pelton about you know his statistical translations he's actually adjusting now for the fact that there are so many bigs and replacement level is higher for bigs so how do you feel about the fact then that there are so many bigs who are going to go in theory in the top six of this draft yeah it's a little bit strange um for sure i mean even even ayton you know is a guy um you could say i mean was like a for sure number one overall guy you know five ten years ago and the fact that he is as well Seeing as that in this draft maybe makes you wonder if we're not adjusting enough. Um, I do like the fact that some of these guys have some modern qualities, though. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I think if we're talking about like, you know, five Al Jeffersons, then it's like, okay, I get it, you know, or like yeah. Jaleel Okafor, like, we're not talking about that. Um, yeah, a, a guy who we we both like were relatively high on back in 2015, and just you know we're totally wrong about. It. Although I do maintain that his injury problems are a bigger part of that his failure than talked. About. Sure. No, I just I think okay, like Bamba, he he can block shots, he can switch, he can lob catch. Maybe the the shooting becomes real. Jaron Jackson, he can switch everything. He blocks shots. He can shoot. You know, there's enough modern fit there. Um, Wendell Carter seems like an old school guy and he is in terms of he does, he's not going to switch in my opinion. Um, but at least he can shoot a three and he can pass, you know? So I think there's a little bit of modern qualities there. Bagley, um, you know, doesn't really think the game or give you much defensively, but I, you know, in theory, he's a guy who could switch. And then he's also just so unbelievable in transition and such an athlete, um, that, you know, you could fit that a little bit. So I, to me, I just don't think the wings are like as interesting, you know, to unseat some of those guys. I think that's a part of it. Like I like Knox. Um, Porter is obviously very talented, but like, you know, even like a Mikhail Bridges, like, I mean, he's a rotation guy. Maybe he's a starter, you know? I, I, so I think while we all want to value wings more, I'm not sure the guys, the wings in this draft and even the guards are all like quite talented enough to to do that. 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's the three that I kind of teased before that I think of the highest upside in the draft are Luka Doncic, Trey Young, and Michael Porter. And uh, Porter is probably as good time as any to talk about him. You know, we were talking about him as a potential contender for the number one overall pick. Uh, certainly, it has not gone well for him since then with the the back injury and you know still i think it was woge's piece where he said he's kind of only at at 50 percent even physically although things uh, checked out what's the latest uh, on his status and how do you get the impression teams are thinking about him right now? yeah um it's been kind of a strange situation you know with obviously missing most of the year this year and then um he clearly didn't look 100 percent when he came back uh and then, you know, he had the pro day, shot it really well, was going to have another pro day. Um, you know, like they canceled that, then they brought it back, then they said it's a medical. And um, so it's been a little bit of a, a back and forth. Um, he really scares me. Uh, and, and it's not just as much about the injury for me. Um, you know, I was I was never like I thought he was obviously really talented and and had a great, you know, showing at the Hoop Summit. And um, but I just I, I still worry about his toughness, um, his his willingness to coexist with other guys on the floor. Um, he plays a game really upright, you know. I think he like he he just he's kind of has like a upright hunched um, style of play to him, which which tend, leads itself to a lot of like long contested jumpers. Um, so to me when you combine that with the injury stuff, he's one of the more scary guys in, in that, you know, top eight range. There have been a number of allusions to Porter kind of not having like the, the best stuff uh, in uh, backgrounds and interviews. Uh, have you heard that as well? And uh, can you elaborate if so uh, on what that's been? Yeah. The, you know, the Intel um, from his time at, at Missouri was very, very poor. Um, and I think he has a lot of questions to answer about, um, you know, how is he going to fit in an NBA locker room? And, and if he's not the number one option, how is that going to go for him? Um, how is he going to handle adversity? You know, I think uh, he is just a little bit incubated in some ways. Um, hmm. But, you know, the fact that he's 6'11", and he can really shoot on the move, you know, and when he's healthy, he's a good athlete. I think he has some instincts defensively as well. Um, there's a lot to like. It's just, you know, I, th- there are a lot of questions too. Um, and, and I think this process has just been uh, really, really interesting to follow um, and, you know, knowing the health and knowing the intel. And um, I just, there are some, some things that if I were an NBA team drafting in the top five, you know, I, I would, uh, I w- you know, there are teams, I mean, I think there are teams like outside of that top five who are, you know, some of their staff members are like, okay, I hope this guy falls to us. And there are others who are like, man, I hope we don't have to make a decision on this guy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and kind of what I had heard is basically that he's a little bit in, in his own world and that the, the world kind of just revolves around him and revolves around him getting 20 points a game. And that, you know, beyond that, he's kind of not really integrated into the team concept. Is that like kind of uh mesh with some of the things that you've heard as well? Yeah, for sure. But you know what? I mean, there are a lot of guys in the NBA who have similar tendencies, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah, and people can evolve, too. Right, you know? and people can evolve, you know? And, um, you know, to come out, to say a 19-year-old kid is like a terrible human being, you know, that would be, like, I, yeah. I would never want to say that myself about, about him. And I, I give him credit for, you know, the, the talented player that he is and, and all that. Um, it's just, uh, you know, I think there's a little bit of an uphill battle there. I, but I do think teams are looking at it as whether he's healthy or not, you know, maybe we give this kid a redshirt year. And if you're a losing team, you're, hey, that buys you another year. You know, you can sell him as, wait, just wait one more year. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. You know, you keep your job another year. Um, and and so I, I think team, some teams are looking at it that way. Hey, we can get this guy. We can integrate him slowly, and then hopefully he'll become you know what he once was. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I certainly am a believer in his outside because just as a shooter like he is at six eleven, able to get out in transition. I mean, you, you mentioned so, some of his defensive instincts. I mean, I don't think he's going to be necessarily a stopper. I think he can provide some weak side shot blocking if he comes around in that area. It's just you know watching him score the way that he did it at that hoop sum was like, all right, this guy is just, and he's got some pretty good moves. He can operate out of the post, I think as well. A little bit of passing instincts. It's just, it's, I certainly understand he's a very risky guy. Now, 
we'll we'll get to Doncic in a second but Trey Young in my opinion he's kind of getting slept on right now um and I I posited this question when we did our pod on him of just why is this guy not in contention for the number one pick in the draft with the the production that he had and also just the gravity that we've seen from these guys who can be unbelievable shooters and I think you know there's two I have two answers to that question one is maybe the shooting just isn't real and number two is the lack of athleticism. What do, what do you think about him? You guys have him mocked, I think, at number eight right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, he's, you know, I, I'm not sold he's going to be the best point guard out of this draft. Um, I just, I mean, the defensive stuff worries me, you know. Um, sure. I know, I know point guards, you know, and like, it, you know, it's obviously not as important as a switching rim protecting big or, or a stopping combo forward, you know, but um I just think he's small and he doesn't have much fight on that end. Um, and it's one thing if you're just kind of a, you know, if you struggle and, and you're not great in that area, but like being a liability, um, I think is, is, you know, it's an issue and he's, he's going to have to learn, um, you know, to, to play in a situation where he doesn't have complete, complete, complete volume and it's not just yeah. his show. Um, and if you look at his numbers, I mean, he didn't have any help throughout this year but if you look at his numbers um once he relied so much on getting to the free throw line early on yeah. um yeah. that once like it, it dropped you know continuously throughout the year and once once those numbers dropped his true shooting percentage like plummeted um yeah. he was shooting like 20 you know seven or something percent from three over the last month or so and um so I, you know i i just i wonder about him physically holding up over 82 games Um, but skill wise, I mean, I think you're right. You know, he, he shoots it with range off the bounce. Um, he's, he's one of the, he's probably the most underrated passer in this draft. Yeah. Um, I think second to Doncic, you know, to me, Doncic is the best passer. He's probably next. I just, I wonder about him physically and him defensively. Yeah. The day I completely share your concerns about Stevens. I think he's going to be bad. You know, he's got decent instincts. I I think, uh, you know, we'll see whether he can get stronger or whether he can fight, but you know, I think the defense only becomes a massive problem. You know, if you're getting into the conference semifinals, the conference finals, which, you know, frankly, if we're talking about a guy who can be, you know, lead offensive player on a team, and okay yeah his defense becomes a problem when you get deep into the playoffs like that's still a pretty good pick right I mean we're we're a little bit I think skewed just by watching the Warriors and Houston and Cleveland and like yeah those that's the top four teams in the league you know I mean there's still 26 other teams that need guys who can score and are just trying to make the playoffs to begin with so I, I I'm a little less worried about that even though I share your concerns I just don't think it's as important perhaps um mm-hmm. and then offensively I'm also worried that you know maybe the shot just isn't real, right? Like maybe, and it's so easy to compare him to Steph Curry and forget that Steph Curry is the greatest shooter in NBA history, and just, right, there right. aren't guys who can make those shots. But I think like what he did for them in transition, the way they pushed the the pace, and just the ability to pull up from 33 feet in transition just causes so many problems for the other team. And then if you have to double team them as well on, on pick and roll in conventional pick and roll defense you know 30 feet from the basket that that's just so powerful that if it is real that's why i think he has just such a a huge upside at least in my opinion yeah i mean he he had his peaks and valleys as a shooter he was kind of when he was really young he was he he was really really streaky um but i mean if you go watch him in an empty gym like he, he can shoot the ball you know i think he's he's up there as arguably the best shooter in this draft um and i think you know the the dips in percentage were more a product of shot selection than anything and kind of, you know, the, the load he had to carry. Um, you know, I just wonder, like, you know, the, the goal for every team is obviously to make it deep into the playoffs, you know. And, and if you can get a piece of somebody who will help you do that, um, and, and then, like, do, do you want to tie yourself to somebody who's going to be a liability on that end of the floor every night? Uh, I don't know, you know, but yeah. offensively he's, he's, he's so gifted. Yeah. No doubt about it. So let's turn out to Doncic as well, who, again, I, I would say just to, cause to me, I'm just most interested in the guys who I think can create efficient offense for themselves. And other. I think that is like the premium skill in the NBA. So you were kind of going back and forth between Doncic and Aiton for, for number one. But then, you know, we're talking about Doncic now being falling to like four or five. Why is that? That's crazy. 
I don't, I wish I had an answer. I, I really don't know. I mean, there are all these freaks, you know. I mean, Mo Bamba's a freak. Um, and I think people are afraid if, you know, they pass on a guy with a 7'10 wingspan who, you know, can block shots and switch and, and do this and that, then, you know, it's going to blow up in their face. And same with Jaron Jackson. And obviously Marvin Bagley was really productive. And, um, you know, Michael Porter has shown the flashes he has when healthy. Uh, I think people see Doncic as more, not me personally, but I think a lot of people see Doncic as more of like a really good starter. And, you know, the the conventional wisdom was always, oh, if he doesn't have a 7-5 wingspan, then what's his upside, you know? But I think that's changed, in my opinion. Like, if if you don't have the brain, then what's your upside? You know, I think that's kind of the era that we're in nowadays. If you don't have the skill level um, and, and, and the wherewithal to you know, play, read and react basketball, then, then that's like, kind of like you mentioned, you know, creating for yourself and others on the perimeter. Um, so yeah, it's crazy to me. I think people are completely overthinking. Well, and, and at some point you just have to give some respect to this production. What are people where we've never seen, I mean, he's probably, if you want to compare him maybe to the way that, you know, we haven't seen this level of production from a guy, his age, or maybe LeBron James's rookie season and Kevin Durant at Texas, uh, and this, you know, I mean, like, like what else? I mean, maybe KG's first year, but he didn't even start until the end of that year. I mean, we haven't seen this type of play from any 18 year old uh, until recently. Never. But yeah. I think people, I think, you know, uh, people go out there and they go to one game or they go to one playoff game and they see this kid who looks a little bit out of shape um, and he's, you know, getting some favorable calls because he's, he's the chosen one and all this and, and they see, you know, and they worry and, and they say like, no, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take Bomba or I'm going to take Jackson or I'm going to take Bagley. Um, and they make up their mind, you know, when it's easy to forget the context of all this in terms of his age, the level he's playing, the fact that he's played an entire NBA season almost since August, which I don't think is talked about enough. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's crazy to me too. I just, I think it's, you know, people not doing the homework in terms of like watching him in different settings, watching him at FIBA, watching him there, understanding his trajectory rather instead just kind of, you know, flying out there for one game or two and, and picking him apart for his flaws. Do you think that there is still a stigma for European players, just in the idea that like, if you draft a European player over an American and it doesn't work out, that it looks worse on your resume than if you pick an American bus. I, I, you know, I, with the way that basketball has evolved and how many international players are, are, you know, thriving in today's NBA, I want to say no, but I think deep down every one of these executives, there is a little bit of that still. I think that's a big reason Aiton's going number one is because, and I think that's a big reason, you know, I see it with myself too. I mean, that's a big reason why I have him number one is because you have this guy who's, you know, like if DeAndre Aiton doesn't make it, you explain to your owner, well, look at this guy. He's 7'1", 260, looks like a freak. He shoots threes. He averaged 20 and 10 at Arizona. Like, how was I supposed to know he wasn't going to make it, you know? Um, whereas I think he actually it, has one of the highest floors of anyone, Aiden. I, yeah, that's why I have him number one, you know? Yeah. I think he's he's a really safe bet. I mean, he's going to be 20 and 10 in the NBA, you know? How much he impacts winning is the question. But yeah. he's going to he's gonna give you that, and I think there's comfort in that. Um, but and, and there should be comfort in Doncic, too, because you've seen this guy. I mean, he's produced against a better level of competition than anyone else in this draft. Um, but I, I think a little, I think that's still there. I really do. I think a little bit of that is still there. If Doncic fails or, or just doesn't become a, a low level all star player, why does he not uh, reach that level? I think he just lets his body go. You know, I think he's he has the type of body where you you need to you need to stay on it. You know, um, he's a little bit like tighten the hamstrings and in the back and then he he gets pudgy you know he just kind of yeah. has a naturally pudgy frame um so i think if he doesn't take care of his body and he doesn't shoot the ball well but to me like, like um i just i i yeah i think the only way he's gonna fail is if his body just goes to hell and and you know i mean he's a guy who's you know, I think he's enjoyed the the nightlife in Madrid a little bit, and um, you know that's it's hard not to as an eighteen year old star in, in a city like that. Um, 
but you know, sometimes the NBA can swallow you up. So if anything, maybe it's that, but um, yeah, I mean, I, along with Aiton, he is the highest floor in this draft. So I don't see him busting. What do you make of the idea? The argument is, you know, I talked to some people about it and they say, well, you can just switch him every time in pick and roll and that's going to shut him down. What, what do you think of that? I think that's when he's struggled, you know, that's, that's when he's had issues um, at times, but he's, he gets to his spots, man. He's big. You know what I mean? Like he's six, eight, 230 pounds. And he's so smart that he can pick you apart. And we've seen him make step back after step back after step back against Porzingis against long athletic guys, you know? So that's the biggest question mark about him. Um, How I would use him is I love him and like, Second side pick and roll, bring him off a zipper and let him get going to his right. And then it's over, you know, like he, he's going to pick you apart. He's see over the top. He's going to drill threes in your face. If you go under, he's going to get to his spots. Um, the, I, I, I kind of like him in, in that role. Um, but again, that's, that's the question, you know, he's, he's looked a little bit heavy footed at times against athletes, uh, when you switch him. Yeah. I do think that he should be able to beat and get good shots against, you know, just your traditional centers of the world. And, and that if you, you know, Steve Nash wasn't like some unbelievable one-on-one athlete. Granted, the game has changed to switch more now. It's more athletic now than it was back then. But if you're playing conventional pick and roll defense against him, like he's going to just carve that up. Like he's just, I mean, maybe no it's doubt. not the greatest finish. I, I guess the other thing you could say is maybe, you know, if you just play it two on two, and force him to get all the way to the rim and finish it against a good contest but he's got like a pretty nice floater game as Mm -hmm. well i mean and he can even if you're gonna help at all you know i think he's gonna carve that up so i i'm pretty high on that and then i think you know he can get to that step back against most bigs and yeah okay you know he could be uh, a great switching team could cause problems for him well a great switching team causes problems for like the absolute (laughs) best players in the nba right i mean like james harden had an awful series against the warriors uh, you know in terms of his efficiency like you're it's just something that not a lot of players in the entire league can beat at this point so you know yeah he should struggle against switch that's 98 percent of the league at this point for sure and like the fact that he's such a good passer is just gonna like open so much up you know like you you can't help because he's such a good passer like he can make and he doesn't need to get by you either that's what i love about him like he can pick you apart from 30 feet you know um he just has such an unbelievable mind so i think when you combine his his shooting and his size and his passing um i think you're right you know it's he's he's gonna be a handful where is he defensively i think he's i think he's gonna struggle a little bit Um, like when he's out on an island, you know, he's not great in that area and he's not great navigating ball screens either, just because kind of his, the way his frame is, you know, he's not like an elusive, like if he's, you know, if he's chasing a shooter or if he's, um, you know, trying to get through a screen, like he's a little bit bulky in that regard, but he's competitive and he's instinctual and he's big and he rebounds and he has, I mean, he has an eight foot nine standing reach, you know, it's not like he's as stumpy as you would think. Um, so I'm not as concerned about him defensively as I am as like a guy like Trey Young, you know what I mean? Just because yeah. he has the size, the instincts and the competitive. Yeah, I think it, it's interesting if you're going to play him at the three, it becomes a little tough because you, you need another solid three and D guy next to him and not like a shooting guard size three and D guy like a guy who can guard the other team's west best wing player like he's not gonna be able to do that I don't think oh last thing I wanted to say too is a little bit of a non sequitur people are worried about what he can do against the switch well he's also got like a nice post game that he can just dribble into you know and then he can carve people up from there I thought his skill level in the post was pretty impressive so he can go after the smallest guy in the other team at 6'8", 230 if the other team is switching for sure and like just use him as a screener you know yeah use him as a screener and then like you know one three pick and roll or wherever you're playing him and then he you know he kills smalls in the post or you can even pop him to space because he can catch and shoot um i mean there are almost no holes in his game uh in terms of skill level Let's talk about Mo Bamba now. I think he is the player that you and I disagree on the most. I don't need to put words in your mouth, but you guys, you saw him work out. You moved him up to number three on your big board, which is kind of like more your opinion of where guys should be, right? As opposed to like the mock draft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you saw him work out. You must have been incredibly impressed by his shooting, seeing him work out. I wasn't wasn't at that workout. Oh, okay. That was uh, good, 
Yeah, that was Gavoni. Um, I've always liked Mo. I mean, I think when we first came out with our mock two years ago, he was number two, you know? So it was never a product of like just going to that workout. Um, I think we've always liked Mo and that was a good reason to, you know, give him the bump or the timing of it was good. But um, yeah, I mean, he's, he's really, really interesting. When I went to, you know, my sister lives in Austin. So I usually go out there a couple times a year. I spent like a week there, went to multiple practices, multiple games. And it wasn't just that. I mean, he was their best shooter in every day in practice. Um, he can shoot and, and he's always had some touch. Um, and I think he's going to be able to shoot NBA threes. Uh, and there's just a lot to bet on there. You know, the questions are obviously, you know, the motor and the physical toughness. Um, but, you know, and those are still questions. But for me, I just with the length and the way he moves and the type of kid he is in terms of off the court. Um, and then, you know, if that, if that shooting becomes real, it's a very unique player. What is your opinion on how mobile he is on the perimeter? I, I you know, I, I watched your video. There's certainly some instances of him moving his feet well, blocking guys shots. I actually though, when I went and looked at all of his possessions and then in looking at, uh, you know a few of his games I saw I think I watched three of his games I actually was not as impressed by uh, his switch ability am I you think I are we just in disagreement there because you seem pretty high on it yeah I think he can switch um I think he you know he needs to stay engaged when on the ball all the time I think that I, I, to me it's not as much a um like can't do it thing then it's like a, all right I'm just gonna let this guy get a step and then see if I can use my length you know yeah um I, I think he has the ability. Like, I remember the PK-80, like, I mean, it was against Butler, but I don't know if you watched that game, but he switched did, every single not, screen yeah. and was chasing guards around the floor. Um, and I just think when you have that kind of length, like, y- y- you know, as you continue to learn scouting reports and how much space you can give them, and um, I think he's still going to be able to keep people in front and, and like, hand contest a jump shot just because he's so long. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he, he wasn't like a – complete stopper on the perimeter this year that's for sure um but i i think he has the ability no question yeah and i guess the the two other things that i and again you know this is because I, i'm being very harsh on him because number one he has these great physical tools and number two you're taking him basically with the idea that like this is a future top three and defensive player of the year player like if he doesn't become that to me you know i don't know that he can fulfill being a top five pick so the reason that i'm probably a little bit harsher on him than others is like if he's going to succeed as a pick he's got to be just unbelievable as opposed to just really good in my opinion and i think that his rotations i was not that impressed by just his instincts overall i felt like he it was rare that you would see him you know anticipate plays as a help defender rather than just react i think that's how how danny put it and i think that's a a fair way to put it for me i mean and i didn't see that many times where he's just he's getting over there he's jumping straight up he's using his chest like making guys uh look bad there and swallowing guys up as opposed to all right i'm gonna come over from the weak side get your shot in the air late uh but he's not kind of proactively preventing penetration am i being too harsh on him from an instinct standpoint I think his instincts are pretty good, um, but I I definitely hear what you're saying. And with him, it's I mean, you could watch ten games and think that, and then someone else could watch ten other games and think the total opposite. Like yeah. that's what's frustrating about him as a prospect. You right. know, like, is like that, that Kansas he's game, just so inconsistent. The Kansas game that I watched at Austin on uh, it was like December 29th or something. The first half, it was just like you know maybe the most dominating half anyone played in college basketball like this whole year. You know, other than maybe like some of those Trey right. Young second half explosions. Like it was ridiculous. But then there's just you know so you can see that you can latch onto that or you can see you know, some of the other games and be like, hey, you know what? Like this isn't there. And so I'm just if he's not that consistent, I, I just yeah he has the upside. I acknowledge that, but I'm just that to me makes me think that the chances of him realizing that upside are a little bit lower than maybe some other people. Yeah. Um, I, again, I, I think it's a, con- you know, definitely a consistency thing, not a like no instincts thing. Um, but that's, you know, certainly a concern. Um, but at the same token, I mean, how many young bigs, you know, that age, uh, yeah, I know he's a little bit old for a freshman, but like, are that consistent all the time, you know? Um, I mean, I don't think Clint Capella was like that at that age, you know? Sure. Um, he had a terrible so week I, at the hoop summit and I way underrated him as a result of that. Yeah. So, you know, I think young bigs are tricky and 
I'm just I, I, I certainly have questions about him though. I mean, I think yeah. he's the most he's fresh he's really, really frustrating. I mean he's a frustrating prospect. And he's he's really, really intelligent, um, almost to a fault at times, you know? Uh, you know, like guys like Clint and and you know, Biggs in that mold oftentimes sometimes it's better when they're just simple guys and you just say, This is what this is your role. You run, you do, you know, you switch, you block shots, you rebound, you lob catch. Boom, that's your role. Go kill it, you know, and that's what they do. But Mo is so uh, he's so intelligent that, you know, he wants to know why. Why am I doing this? Um, wait a minute. Like if I if I shoot 80 percent on NBA threes in practice, then why am I diving? You know, um, and so sometimes I think things like that can maybe be frustrating at times um, and, and getting him to buy in. Like to me, it wasn't about the oh, he made all these threes in an empty gym. Let's put him at three. Um, the, the, like the, that's a cherry on top. If he's, if he's making shots, that's a cherry on top, you know? But for me, he's like, you said, he's going to need to be dominant defensively. That's where it needs to start for him. Yeah. I mean, we could talk about Bamba probably for the next like 30 minutes, uh, but, but we got to move on here. We haven't talked about Bagley at all. I, I was not as high on him just to, because of the, the fit, the, the defense. I, I think my, my thought was if he's going to be, a, a guy who's worthy of a top five pick. He's just going to have to be a dominating offensive player. And, and, you know, we're not talking about him necessarily going number one, you know, but like my comparison for him offensively was Chris Bosch. What, what do you think of that? Yeah, I think there's something to that. I've always said he's, he kind of reminds, he's not quite like the roller dunk on your head guy, but if Amari Stoudemire grew up in like a modern, in like today's yeah. NBA, where like you shoot more threes and you handle in transition, just in terms of like what he does, right? Like he's an aggressive, athletic scorer who doesn't really make others better and doesn't really guard, you know? But like he's, his, his explosiveness can put pressure on the rim. He's an unbelievable offensive rebounder. And the fact that he can make an occasional three, he's, that, that's going to have to be the key for him. Like if he can become a passable NBA three point shooter to where you have to close out hard, then he's going to be really, really tough. Um, but the defense, it's just I, to me, like for him, I watch him and say like instincts, you know, like I don't see the oh, yeah. instincts and he doesn't quite have the natural length to follow to fall back on. Um, like I see a guy who's going to put up really big numbers on a team that might not win a ton of games. Yeah, and uh, your pod that you did with Woj on Friday, you mentioned that his his desire to go get twenty and ten right away, and he actually wouldn't mind being drafted by the Kings. So that's, uh, I mean, and I don't it's think a perfect he's, fit. Yeah, well, <laughs> to me, I I think that his what do you think he can be as just a one on one score? Because as a guy who is probably going to be a pure power forward. If you play him at center, your defense, I think, is likely to be pretty compromised. Maybe he can develop as a switch guy. I'm not counting on that. So can he be a dominating one-on-one offensive player? Because if he's just kind of like a nice, all right, I can get some offensive rebounds and, and dunk some lobs and shoot some threes. I mean, I think that's not quite enough to deal with the defensive trade-offs when you're talking about, you know, again, a guy in the top five. Can he be like a big one-on-one score? I think again, like if he if the jump shot really becomes a thing, um, yeah. like a legitimate, this is what I'm leaning on because I mean he's explosive, man, and like yeah. effortlessly explosive. Like he can look like he's going at half speed and he's by you head at the rim. Um, just the way he moves, like he almost moves like a big wing. Uh, so, but to me, I think like he's gonna have to for him to maximize who he is, he's gonna have to be a five. I, not he's not going to have to be a five, but like his best minutes offensively are going to be at the five. So I, yeah. I think he's going to have to find a way to like really. I think you said it. You know, like if he can switch, that's his best bet. Just be because he's he's quick enough. He just doesn't have the anticip like the anticipation. Um, yeah. So Seems like yeah, he struggles I mean, getting a into a stance too. Like in terms of you know whether it's. I mean, he played a. Ton, he was another guy who played a ton of minutes too. But uh, it just seems like he can't really like sit down very well defensively. Yeah, I think he, I think he can when he wants to. He's yeah. just, it's you know, he's never. I mean, he's never played USA basketball. He's never played like he hasn't played a lot of meaningful games until this year um, by choice. You know, um, so there's just a lot of bad habits there. Yeah, and when I said Chris Bosh, I I don't think that he's going to be as good as Bosh. You know, Bosh is a Hall of Fame level player and, and way better defensive tools. You know, I think Bagley's wingspan is like seven foot, and Bosh was like seven three, seven four. But in terms of, I love his first step as, as you alluded to, and then yeah, if the jumper comes around, if he can face up from the mid post, use that jab step game, use the threat of the jumper to blow by guys going hard to his left hand. You know, I think like that's that's where it succeeds is him 
just like, you know, being able to beat guys one on one. And then it's like, all right, you know, maybe he's not a amazing modern player in terms of like getting to, you know, two way ability. Uh, but, you know, he could maybe be a lower end all star type of guy is just a, a score and rebounder. Uh, it's just, but, I, you know, he's actually able to do that against power forwards, right? He's too slight. He doesn't have like the traditional post game, really like turnaround jumper hook shot type of stuff. Like he's got to be able to like face up and blow by guys to me. And, he, and he's actually able to do that against, you know, a Thaddeus Young type of player if he's playing the four. Right, exactly. Best minutes will come at the five. And he has a little bit of a positional handle too. Like I think he'll be able to grab and go. I, you know, I just, I wish he was a better passer. I think he'd be really yeah. interesting if he was a better passer and maybe that'll come. Um, yeah, he's a, he's kind of a tough fit. All right. Well, I, you know, Wendell Carter, I think we, we can probably don't have to talk about him quite as much. I, I think it, cause he's, uh, I don't know that there's a lot of like controversy about what he is necessarily, but let's move further down in the draft guys. I haven't really had a chance to take a look at. So uh, who are some of your favorite guys, you know, kind of in the 10 to 30 range and then maybe some that you feel uh, might be a little bit overrated as of this. Point. Yeah, um, I really like Kevin Knox. I, you've seen Kevin Knox. He really sure. struggled uh, sure. during Hoop Summit, and um, you know he had his ups and downs. But he's been really, really good. Uh, you know, in the pre-draft process, and he had some really impressive flashes this year. I mean, he's six nine. Uh, you know, strong upper body, legs are a little slight, nine foot standing reach, and he can really like he's turned himself into a impressive shooter on the move um they used him kind of you know off screens like sprinting all over the floor into mid-range jumpers and floaters which you know is probably not how he's going to be used in the nba but i just i like his size his length his ability to shoot in different ways uh he has an unbelievable floater game uh and he's 18 he's one of the youngest players in this draft so i could see him us looking back and saying you know he was like a top five type of talent from this draft um does he do anything else other than score at this point in time? You're, he's, you're gonna, if you like him, you think he's gonna be a good defender, um, yeah. and, and that's what he, that's what he was when he was young. Like we first saw him, he was like 15, and he was, I think he was still a, court, a high school quarterback then too. Uh, his dad played in the NFL, and he, uh, he was like a guard, everybody like super energy. I thought he was gonna be more like Sean Marion, you know. I thought that yeah. was gonna kind of be his, his, his deal, but. Uh, he got it stuck in his head that he needed to be a three and he needed to be this and that um, and kind of went away from that. Um, so I'm hoping he's going to regain some of that. But no, he he's, he doesn't make others better at this point um, and he needs to get tougher. But I, I do think there's a little bit of that inside of him. He just needs to get comfortable and he's young, you know. He's like I said, he's one of the younger guys in the draft. Uh, who else do, do you really have on your radar screen kind of later in the first round? Yeah, um, I really like Lonnie Walker. Uh, from Miami, six four and a half, uh, six ten wingspan, big time athlete, above the rim guy, um, and I I love his ability to shoot it in a variety of ways. He's one of these guys who can just elevate over top of you. Uh, he's a little bit streaky, and you know, similar to Knox, you could ask, what does he do when he doesn't score? Um, you know, he he needs to improve uh, his decision making and you know defensive engagement, but. Um, I think he's really interesting. I think he's a guy who's going to look a lot better in the NBA than he did in college. Yeah, he was pretty inefficient. Was that due, you think, just to his situation? Like, you know, kind of like Jalen Brown, although, you know, Jalen Brown's success, although I was high on him, I think you were higher on him than a lot of people were, even when it was a surprise that he went number three because he wasn't being talked about in that range. But, like, his success after being, like, totally inefficient in college now is going to give ammo for – any other player who wasn't successful too. And it's like, I think that could maybe lead to like a lot of kind of excuse making and misses. But, you know, on the other hand, you've talked about, you wrote an article about guys who, you know, their college context wasn't particularly uh, conducive to success. So is he one of those guys? Yeah, he is. Um, you know, first of all, he he had a knee injury leading up to the year and, and he's always been kind of like a feel things out type of guy. Um and takes them a little bit to get comfortable. And they had, you know, so, some new guys there. Chris Likes, their point guard, freshman who, you know, likes to pound it. Jaquan Newton, who likes to pound it. Um, there just wasn't a whole lot of rhythm to what they were doing with some of the some of the other guys in the backcourt. Um, and, you know, he, he had his ups and downs. But he had some unbelievable games. I mean, he hit a game winner against Boston College. Um, you know, he, he had some like 25 plus point games. Uh, he, he can really get going. Like when every move he makes is an NBA move. Um, so I, yeah, I, th I think it was more a product of, of situation and, and also his personality type. Um, he, I, he kind of does remind me of Jalen Brown 
as a as a kid a little bit actually like you know people question Jalen um in, in a few different areas and and uh just like you know he was he was a little bit different than your traditional prospect and, and this kid has a little bit of that also can Lonnie Walker guard threes or is he too small for that uh I think he's best guarding ones and twos but as he continues to get stronger and you know he's long enough um he just he doesn't play that wide you know he doesn't he doesn't play um all that wide but I think, you know, with the way the game is now with multiple ball handlers and uh, I think he can guard some threes. Oh, you know who we didn't even talk about at all was uh, Jaron Jackson. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can talk yeah. about him. No, yeah, we definitely should. I, I'm i probably about two-thirds of the way through my uh, stuff on it. But if you want to just talk about him a little bit, I, I don't want to uh, yeah, waste too sure. many of my opinions because I want to save it for our own pod. But uh, what, what are your thoughts on him and where he fits into this uh, this big man morass at the top here yeah I, I mean a lot of nba folks think he's you know he's number one on their board um just with the combination of age length switching uh rim protection when he's not on the perimeter and then shooting as well he, he shoots kind of a funny ball but you know his numbers have been there um on a decent volume you know dating back to, to eybl so he's he's kind of like the epitome of the modern big at least amongst guys in this draft um the question for me is is he ever going to be more than kind of just like a piece? You know what I mean? Like a really, really good starter, uh, potentially all-star. Uh, I just, his feel to me um, is still very much improving in terms of like thinking the game quickly. And as a guy who you want to operate on the perimeter, who's going to have to be reading closeouts and scrambling defenders, um, you know, I think he's still improving there. And and he was a little bit soft um, earlier on in his his high school career and he's improved a little bit in that regard but you know he struggled with foul trouble um this year as well so i i I think he's really really interesting um i just wonder is he ever gonna be like your first or second option yeah what is like the versatility of of that jump shot like is he just all right i'm just gonna stand there on a spot up and you throw it to me if i'm wide open i'm gonna shoot it or or do you think he could be more than that as a shooter i think that's kind of what it is you know i don't think he's a guy who like you throw it to in the mid post he's gonna inside pivot jab you and then you know like splash jumpers in your face um i think it's pretty easy to contest he gets it off pretty quickly when he's you know has his feet set but yeah i see him more as like a trail three or pop guy um but he can put it down i mean he can he can handle a little bit um he's just uh, he's gonna have to improve as a passer yeah but like in pick and pop does it does it look pretty good can he shoot you know on the move is if his feet aren't quite set or or is it just kind of like he's really got a like be square and set up and it's you know takes him a while to get off like where does he fall kind of on that spectrum i think he can i think he can pick and pop you can pick and pop yeah. um you know you're not gonna like sprint him off a screen or anything but i mean you can pick and pop him he'll get his feet set quickly enough and he get he gets it off pretty quickly um it's just you know it, with that release point like he needs space yeah yeah because he's really shooting it like almost under his chin it, it seems like but uh it, all right well i, I don't want to spoil too too much of my uh, opinions on him but uh anyone else that's you've got your eye on it later on in the draft i really like kevin herter the kid from maryland i think he's really interesting uh six seven he's younger than you know bomba and porter and Aiton and a lot of these guys he's a sophomore um, probably would have been a top 10 pick for sure if he went back to school next year. But yeah, six seven can shoot it on the move. He's competitive and he can really pass. Um, and like a functional passer, he, you know, he's, he really reads the floor quickly, um, has a great IQ. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think he's a guy who's maybe going to go in the, you know, late teens who, uh, could, you know, end up looking like a, you know, top 12 type of guy from strap. What about guys who are, are being talked about, you know, relatively high that, that maybe you're not as high on? Yeah. Um, Mikhail Bridges, I think, is a nice player. Um, but, you know, I, I, as like a top 10 guy, I'm not sure if I'm completely sold on, on what he gives you. Um, you know, I like that he can shoot it. I like his length. I like him as a kid. Um, I, you know, I think he gets beat off the dribble a lot more than probably gets talked about. Uh, he just has such good length that it kind of covers it up. Um, Zaire Smith has a lot of buzz. Um, you know, I'm not quite as sold on him. I like his mentality. He's a really tough kid. He's a freak athlete. He's really young. He has a little bit of a feel, but he played the four at, you know, six, four, um, at Texas tech. And I think that allowed him to do some things that he's probably not gonna be able to do in the NBA. Um, and then, you know, I, I'm not quite as high on, 
like I said, on on Porter and, and Trey as some. Yeah, so Bridges, you don't see him. Is he kind of more of like an Otto Porter type adequate defender than like a, a real guy that you think can guard the best threes in the NBA effectively? Right. Yeah, he has, he's just, he's not like that fluid in his, I don't know, something about his lower body. I don't know if it's high hips or he has like big feet, skinny ankles, you know? Yeah. Um, and again, I like his length. He's competitive. You know, he's won a lot of games. I just, I, I yeah, I'm not sure he's quite that like lockdown of a guy. And I think he, I mean, he's kind of limited offensively, to be honest. He, you know, he, he can shoot it on the move a little bit. He has long strides. Um, but you know, I, I just I, I don't see a whole lot there in terms of like making other guys better or, or you know handling in second side or doing any of that stuff like he's he's uh pretty much just a catch and shoot attack a closeout type of guy for me yeah now if he can really be a guy who makes threes and plays above average defense uh and now you know the, the, that's what's so hard about these three and d guys it's like number one you know who's going to improve their shot or whether the ball is really going to go in for them for NBA three. I mean, it's, it's just, it's so hard to predict that now. I mean, it's so hard to predict that two years into guys, NBA careers, a a lot of times, and then defense, you know, individual defense is also really hard to evaluate it and the way guys improve. So just, you know, you can kind of take these bites at the apple for three and D guys, you know, and he's certainly one of those, like that everyone would love to have those, but I think it's just so hard to evaluate who the guys are going to be, who are actually good in that role. For sure. Yeah, no question. Um, but, you know, he's safe and he's proven. And I think if you're Philly, you know, you, you could use a guy like that. And it makes sense. And especially with Brett Brown's involvement in this draft. Um, the, one, the one guy I, you know, before we wrap up, I just want to touch on Robert Williams. I, I think he's a guy who's, uh, you know, maybe he slides to 15, 16, 17. I don't know. But um, I think he, at the end of the day, might end up being talked about in that Jaron Jackson, Mo Bamba, um, you know, all that glut of bigs if if he lands in the right situation. Yeah, because I mean, he's, he's got the length. It sounds like he has pretty decent mobility and, uh, you know, can get up for some alley-oops. And so that's uh, maybe that's a, another indication of like, hey, you know, there's so many centers in the NBA now. If you can get a guy like Robert Williams at 15, do you want to take a another center in the top five when you know you're just it's so much harder to find a point guard or a wing or or something like that uh last question here though you predicted donovan mitchell would be the rookie of the year i guess he's probably not going to be uh but it seems that was certainly given his production in probably 90 percent of the years he would have been rookie of the year i mean he wasn't even necessarily supposed to start for the jazz like what made you i mean i know you're very familiar with this game obviously uh and liked him but like what made you pull the trigger on that pick of him as as rookie of the year at the start of the year yeah um i i mean i liked him at a you know at a young age and i think when i first saw him i was like okay he's kind of like norman powell you know like you know shoots a little bit better at the same age and then i kept watching him kept watching him he just kept getting better and better and then you sit down and talk with the kid and you're like all right my chance this guy fails um watching him at at utah summer league just like go at Jason Tatum over and over and over again. Um, I was like, man, this kid is is the real deal. And then I think we made our picks actually after um, after a pre like a couple preseason games even. So I went and saw him against the Clippers. I spoke with him, and he was unbelievable. And I'm like, just kind of putting all the pieces together, you know, going back, watching a little bit more at, at Louisville. Um, yeah, and just thought, I mean he's an absolute killer you know he guards three positions he can shoot it off the dribble and he's the type of kid who's not afraid of anything um so yeah i mean i'm 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 happy for him just from where he was because as you know we've talked about all year i mean he was really just a an athlete like a hard playing two foot dunker early on in his high school career because like his skill development is just completely ridiculous to me like did you see did you see this coming that he would be this like you know these scoop shots around the rim and like this uh, incredible finishing that he suddenly had and the passing like was that something that you like did he even exceed your expectations even though you picked him as rookie of the year or were you kind of like all right people are gonna know (laughs) pretty quick like I see this right now uh, a mix of the two, I think. That's what I was seeing, like at like in that preseason game. Yeah, I was like, they were they were playing him on the ball, and he was like hitting that weak side corner, no problem. He was like, yeah, all those like inside foot, inside hand scoop finishes. Like he was starting to show that. And then I talked to him after the game. I did a quick interview with him and was just asking him about all that stuff. Um, 
And it just kind of opened my eyes like, man, like this, the, the, how quickly he's gotten better is just ridiculous. And it was, it was interesting to me watching him throughout the year and everyone saying uh, just like, you know, how skilled and, and all this and that. And man, like he, you know, how did he go 13 if he had all these finishes? And, but he never had that, you know, I know. Like he never had I any know. of that at Louisville. Um, and yeah, I mean, all, all credit to him. I mean, he's like, I've never seen anyone improve within the course of a season like that. Like it was almost something new every game. Yeah. I mean, he was shooting like 28% from three, I think like after a month and I was kind of like, all right, guys, calm down a little bit here. Like, <laughs> yeah, this is not that great. And I was like, that show, shows what I know on him. But yeah, I mean, it's, I, I'm, uh, that was, a, that's one of those ones where it's like really just being in there, knowing the guy, knowing how he picks stuff up, uh, can can be really useful all right man well thanks a lot for coming on uh mike underscore schmitz that's the twitter right that's it and uh we'll look forward to watching you for uh the draft coverage thanks again so much for for coming on i love doing this yeah thanks for having me man always uh one of my highlights so i appreciate it i was bringing danny now to talk a little bit of this Kawhi leonard and any other news that's come down as well over the weekend and the Kawhi news broke on friday morning it was uh a calculated series of leaks to say the least as shams chris haynes and jabari young all tweeting out that Kawhi leonard wants to be traded i don't think the nomenclature was he has requested a trade because the spurs supposedly said that he hasn't asked them for a trade yet but certainly appears that Kawhi leonard no longer wants to be in san antonio that coming on the heels of Woj, his piece wasn't as cut and dried necessarily but implying that perhaps they would want leonard to play out the season and then would offer him the designated player new contract as opposed to a designated player veteran extension not sure whether they would have offered it or not this much ballyhooed sit down between Kawhi and greg popovich has not happened yet uh but what are your initial thoughts here now Well, I think the place to start with all of this is the very significant, should that offer have been available either now or if he had qualified at the end of this season, it is a very real financial sacrifice for Kawhi Leonard. He he goes from the maximum added money to on his contract on a designated veteran extension being 5219 to even if he got traded somewhere else, 5188. So that's 30 million just straight up gone. And then if he were to sign with a different team, then that would go to four years, 139. And those are at the current estimate, which, and that estimate might be a little bit rich. So we'll see, maybe that would meet the difference a little bit if it ends up lower in 2019. So that is a part of this, that he is making a very real sacrifice. You could say he could make that up in money in various forms, including the fact that Kawhi Leonard rejected a shoe deal with Jordan, which was reportedly four years and more than $20 million per season. No, so no, no, maybe no, no, he thinks no, he can make no, some of that, that up. It was four years. It was four twenty total. total. Yeah, it was five million. Okay, no, sorry, he would have been all wrong. about that if, if he could have gotten twenty million. That's he right. Been all about that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, so but maybe he I, and there is a, a reason to believe, even though Kawhi is not necessarily the most photogenic person in the world that he that just the exposure there could be there and also you know negotiating during the season when he basically missed the whole year that could help him as well. So we'll see where that part of it goes and. Players are within their rights to prioritize whatever they want. And we do not yet know what Kawhi wants. And that is the part of this that I'm the most interested in as we move forward, is that Kawhi has more control over his destination than most guys who don't have like a no trade or anything like that. Because not only do you have the issues related to re-signing, because he is a on a with one year and then that player option, as opposed to Kyrie, which was two. So the interest, it's more like Paul George, where the interest is, do you want him as a rental? Do you want him as something else? And he can basically just say to any team that he's not interested, I'm not going to re-sign with you. And they can believe him, they can not believe him. That's fine. But generally, that will lower the price. And then also, just what information gets shared from a medical perspective you know like presumably since Kawhi has his own doctors whatever he authorizes those doctors to share is something that he can share with some teams and yeah well presumably the spurs have access to that information as well and presumably well okay well let's presume it but he just has (laughs) yeah so but he just has more he has more control over the process because some teams might not be willing to take the risk and where i think this it comes to a point in terms of Kawhi's impact is with the Boston Celtics because Boston has a ton of assets still, even after giving up the Nets pick and Isaiah and Jay Crowder for Kyrie, 
they still have a series of different high value picks. They have a lot of players. A lot of their young players have worked out very well. But if Kawhi is a little bit icier in terms of re-signing there, then it gets into the question of, is it worth moving Jalen Brown, moving Jason Tatum, or even that Kings pick, you know, whatever, however they value those assets for somebody who might be a rental, especially because, as we've talked about before, the Celtics don't have salary filler. So it gets a lot harder to make a deal. Right, because they're going to actually, whoever they give up is going to be extremely valuable in terms of salary. And, you know, I don't know that we need to get into specific trades for him quite yet you know I, I think we need to hear a little bit more that like they really are going down that road I mean certainly I think your next attempt if you're the Spurs would be like hey you know what like we would consider moving you but like Kawhi and Pop have to really sit down and I want to hear it from Kawhi as Greg Popovich you know that this is really what you you know that that would be my tip now maybe they just never grant him that sit down the other thing that I still think is just being not discussed nearly enough in this situation is Kawhi's health and number one just like whether he's going to be a clean bill of health in, in terms of the trade and then how does that affect his trade value I mean I think people are going a little bit overboard and just talking about him like yeah he's still this top five level of player in the league and yeah maybe that's true when he's healthy how many minutes is he going to be able to play during the regular season is this really a degenerative condition as some people have potentially discussed is it the type of thing where okay you know maybe you can pass a physical right now but this is kind of a wear and tear type of thing it's a pain management type of thing it's a you know something that's been going on supposedly since late in the 2016 season potentially so with all of that can, how comfortable can you really be as a receiving team number one the re-signing aspect as you mentioned but then number two that he's going to be healthy for not only this year but then even if he wants to re-sign for the next four or five years and you know he's 27 now it's i mean this is at his age one of the best players you know if you're going to say that he's healthy that's been on the trade market in a very very long time you know i mean you would have to go back probably to dwight howard but howard had had that back surgery and so you know it's kind of a similar situation where we didn't really know if he's gonna be healthy again but he was playing at a top five level of player before then chris paul probably around there too even paul probably wasn't considered a top five player at the time that he was traded another guy with one year left on his contract and with draft picks ever more valuable even in the last five years than they were back in 2011 2012 i just don't think that the spurs are going to get some awesome ransom for him especially when you don't know what his health is and so if you're talking about with the celtics jalen brown plus the king's pick i don't think so I don't think I would give that up if I were the Celtics. Well, I'm not sure I would give up either yeah. of them. Well, the the Kings pick is because interesting. I would like to see what the Kings offseason looks like. There have been some rumblings that they're going to make an ill-fated attempt to get slightly better. <laughs> of course they are. But you know, since they don't have their pick this year. But yeah, I mean, it, it's... Uh, no, I, I agree. And now... You know, we always talk about where does the leverage come from in these type of trades, right? Like there's internal leverage, which is, hey, you know what? If you guys don't give us a good enough offer, we're just going to not trade the guy. Well, okay, maybe, maybe they can take that approach and maybe they could say, you know what? We'll get you into camp and if things go well, we'll offer you that 219 and, then, and maybe, maybe they'll feel different if the 219 actually gets offered this summer on the other hand the reasons for wanting this trade real or manufactured are well after Kawhi went to get the second opinion he thought that the organization kind of dragged him through the mud that there was a, a breakdown of trust and therefore he just doesn't want to go back there he's done with them you know which is interesting I mean another reason too which hasn't been talked about is you know how is this Spurs squad actually in championship contention and, and you've made this distinction on Twitter of winning a lot of games in the regular season versus actually being in championship contention you know Danny Green doesn't seem to be the same player anymore Tony Parker is not you know they got big questions at point guard I mean LaMarcus Aldridge is really the only other premium player on this roster right now and so if I'm Kawhi, I'm kind of wondering of like, how am I supposed to win a championship here? If that if that's what's really important to him, whether it's uh, you know as opposed to kind of the Uncle Dennis, oh he wants to wants him to be more in the limelight and blah blah all that stuff. You know he's kind of being set up as a little bit of like a prima donna here, which I'm who knows whether that's the case or not. But I mean, just in terms of winning, you know, the Spurs are not the best place for him anymore. I don't think you know so well. And there's another elephant in this room, which is 
a lot of people don't want to talk about, which is the open question of how long Greg Popovich yeah. is going to coach we this team. We talked about that on Thursday and for uh, those, with Woj's report. Yeah. For those of us... Yeah, for those of us who believe that Popovich is a part of what makes the Spurs special, and that means Popovich on the sidelines. He could still be involved from a personnel perspective, as he was before he was their head coach. That was a long time ago now. But if the feeling is that Greg Popovich being on the sidelines is special, I picked him recently as the best coach in the NBA. I think you, you know you were either you had him one or two. I can't remember, and that is still true. And so if they re- if if he goes to some other some other coach, even if it's somebody who's well versed in the Spurs, like Atori Messina or the best young coach out there, it's something different. And so it is very reasonable for Kawhi to think at least by the end of that contract, Popovich will not be the coach of the Spurs. It could very well be really early in that contract. And so if you think that Popovich is part of what makes them special, then that is a, a genuine concern. And I I definitely feel that way. And that gets into kind of it's it's a different kind of timing what i think is the most intellectually interesting well, here, part can, of this can I finish exercise up on one more thing too on the, the on the idea sure, of sure. internal leverage okay so if he really wants to be gone and he has all these reasons do you want to risk a vince carter situation do you want to risk an Allen iverson situation where he comes into camp and he's just kind of unhappy and unhealthy now you can make the argument that hey you know what if he wants other teams to really like where he's at as a player, you know, he has to come in and play really well and he's a competitor and, you know, maybe he wouldn't, wouldn't just like totally tank the season. You know, I mean, this is what people were criticizing the Cavs for not just like bringing Kyrie Irving into camp after his trade request and seeing if the, it could get worked out. So if you were going to make that criticism, like, oh, the Cavs made such a shitty deal and like, you know, how did you just cave so easily? I thought the Cavs actually made a good deal, but you know, everyone is killing the Cavs now for like not managing that situation better. And certainly you could say that the Spurs haven't managed this situation perfectly either. But so now you're going to say that, hey, they should bring Kawhi Leonard into camp too and try and work it out with him. You know, is that what your advice is? Or are you willing to risk this idea that he could play even worse and tank his trade value even more? Now, I don't think that that would happen as much because of the health questions as well, right? I mean, I think it can hopefully go in a positive direction from a health standpoint, unless... You know, you could say now, oh, he'll pass a physical now, but we think he's going to start developing pain again once he gets into camp. And so maybe we better strike now before the bloom goes off the rose again for the health standpoint. There's just so many moving parts here as far as the idea that they could actually hold on to him and you better wow us with an offer. Yeah, and and that ties in exactly with where I wanted to go, which is the idea of kind of external leverage timing. And you have these windows. I've talked about this before with other negotiations like yeah. the Paul George one that, that happened and, and last to be summer. Real, clear so, really quickly here uh external leverage is oh you better give us a better offer because this other guy's offer is going to beat you right and so that changes around a lot based on these different windows so one window is before or at the draft and so at that point you the big benefit is that you can select you can add in players who were drafted and depending on how you do it you can make it so it fits within the stepian rule there are all sorts of all sorts of things there so if san antonio has guys that they like in this class wherever they are in the draft maybe it's in the top five maybe it's in the at 15 or maybe it's at 11 or whatever they can they can work within that and you run the risk af- as soon as you cross that rubicon that the cars are off the lots and you know, it just depends on who's where and certain guys, you know, their stock can be elevated after the draft because they had a good summer league or or whatever. But a lot of other times, because you don't have the choice in the matter, then that is a, a weak point. And the other specific reason that matters this year is because while I am no expert in this, the general opinion that I have heard is that the 2019 draft class is meaningfully weaker than the 2018 yeah. draft and class. And just having so by seen waiting, those guys at the Hoop Summit, I would agree with that at this very early point. So then that changes the way that you think about it. And then you have, as you said, the kind of the health-related questions. And also, once you get later into this, like I, I wrote a piece for The Athletic kind of talking about the timing logistics. And one of the ideas for me is just kind of how these other circumstances change. And so I didn't spend a lot of time on this, but the idea of just how teams fill out their rosters so if the lakers i'm not gonna we don't want to get into specific trades but if like if they use up their cap space this year and know that they're gonna have no cap space next summer that changes their approach to trading for Kawhi leonard it's just like a lot of these other teams if they draft a guy and they really like him at the beginning of summer league and then they go okay maybe we're thinking about this a little bit differently so it it all changes at different points and we don't know what the spurs would want if they decide to trade Kawhi, but it changes at each one of these kind of windows now the other part of the reporting is woge saying 
that he wants to be in LA either Lakers or Clippers those along with the Celtics and Sixers are really the four teams that are being discussed no uh, there's some indication to people saying that like oh they might want to get him to the Knicks but really there doesn't seem to be a trade that could possibly be made there unless Porzingis were included and I don't know that the Knicks would want to do that and you know even if you get Porzingis and Kawhi yeah then maybe you could try to build around those and get into being a solid team in your conference again you know but I don't think the the Knicks have enough with the kitchen sink included you know I mean maybe maybe if they put in Neil Aquina and number nine and another first round pick maybe you could start to to think about that if again you know Kawhi were saying he's willing to resign this is also the interesting part of this I I always think that like hey if you want to go somewhere and you want to win aren't you better off just like pretending that you don't want to resign there even if you kind of do because then your trade value is lower and then when you get to that place they still have more assets there to help you win with you know that that's kind of always like a little interesting game theory aspect of this it does seem though like if it's the Lakers that he wants to go to can they get him when other teams certainly could offer superior packages but because in theory Kawhi might be willing to commit to re-signing there as opposed to other places that they might be willing to offer more because they feel like they have a tacit understanding he would re-sign as opposed to the Sixers or the Celtics where they don't have that understanding they feel like they have to convince him and so we can't give up that much and now because we feel like we don't have a commitment for him we can't give up that much and it could only be one year now maybe a Lakers package would end up being superior to the Celtics and Sixers packages even though those teams uh, have more assets I think although I'm not sure that the Sixers have more assets well i guess if you throw in faults they they might depending on san antonio faults yeah and again this ties in with the idea of what do the spurs want they have lamarcus aldridge who just had an all nba caliber season and is on the older side i think this was his age 30 year is that oh right? no he's Something old he's like, like 32 okay so so do they want to be more competitive or do they want to get these more developmental pieces it, it is a real challenge and the the spurs haven't had to really choose that in a long time but i'm fascinated to see yeah, what lamarcus goes. turns 33 in july by the way he had a hell of a year uh but how long that continued tough to say so i don't know this is going to be really interesting so many pieces up in the air the health where he actually might be willing to resign i do not anticipate that this is going to be resolved quickly and i know certainly you'd have to say number one because of that piece that woge wrote implying that perhaps the supermax wasn't going to be offered number two just because we're coming up on the draft and it's trade season but none of the teams that he wants to go to have a high enough pick where it's like okay we're gonna you know there has been some talk that the kings could could maybe get involved with number two uh eh, don't really see him staying there if he uh plays there for a year but you know like you've said there could be an orlando for serge Ibaka type of thing but we're talking about we're not talking about the number 11 pick you know we're talking about a, a pick in the top five but i don't think that the draft imparts that much urgency you know probably whoever the number 10 pick is if it's philly might be involved in the trade but that's not you know number 10 is not important enough where it's like okay we're gonna get this done now but it just uh, my overarching prediction here is we have a long way to go in whether he's actually going to get traded we have a long way to go to figure out the health situation you know shams is saying oh he's 90 percent, he's going to be ready but you know again I, i'll believe that when i see it not that it can't happen but i'm not just buying all right he's, he's miracle cured he's ready to go and, and he's not gonna have a recurrence of this and then my last point here is i think the trade package is going to be smaller than a lot of people believe unless he really you know comes back and looks amazing in the preseason and they wait that long but you know that's high risk high reward for the spurs um but i, I even then i still just don't think the package is going to be as big as people are expecting yeah and i wanted to make one small point i think that there's been a lot of revisionist history on what happened last offseason which is incredibly frustrating for me intellectually with these people going oh well look at what happened with the pacers and paul george and look at what happened with the the Cavs and Kyrie. Based on what we knew at that point, the return that the Cavs got was substantially better. We, yeah. Victor Oladipo at that point hadn't proven anything. You know, all of this stuff about, oh, look at the return that the, the Pacers got for Paul George. You know, it's like, yeah, we didn't think that at the time. I mean, Oladipo was, hadn't impressed too much in OKC or in Orlando, and he was on that $20 million flat contract, 20, 21, five yeah. or whatever. Sabonis so had done and, nothing the year before. So, but yeah, Sabonis so had been, yeah, he'd been the starting power forward for them kind of because somebody had to be. And, oh, that's the last point I have to make. I am a fierce pragmatist. I think anybody who listens to the show would know that. But 
if San Antonio refuses certain destinations, which would which make oh, superior offers, that is malpractice. Straight up malpractice. You do not turn down or refuse to negotiate with a team because that would be bad. Especially, and this is what I was getting at in that tweet, if you're not a direct competitor with them, it's not like trading him to the Lakers lowers San Antonio's chances of winning a championship because San Antonio is probably not going to win a championship in the next five years if they trade Kawhi Leonard. So I'm not saying the Spurs will or will not do that. I'm just saying that that mentality, which may have been a part of the Paul George trade because it's been kind of bandied about with that one, that is a straight up mistake if if any team does that, Spurs or anyone yeah, else. Whether it's the Lakers, whether it's, oh, we can't trade him in conference. It's like, you know, the only team that maybe ever should have done that was Cleveland with Kyrie because you know they still had lebron and they were still trying to win as it turned out they beat the very team they traded to in part because Kyrie was out maybe who knows how that series would have gone if Kyrie had been healthy who knows how it would have gone if isaiah had been healthy and and had been traded and jake i mean there's so many moving parts there uh but that that was just such a weird trade to have a team that good have to trade somebody and then you know lebron's upcoming free agency like we're not gonna see a trade like that maybe even in our lifetimes again to see a team someone like that traded but like yeah unless you have lebron james on your team you're not gonna be competing for a conference championship take the best offer regardless uh a little more news here Darrell arthur has opted in to his 7.4 million dollar player option for next season big surprise there uh a report uh from kelly eco out of houston that trevor ariza is looking for 50 to 60 million dollars i don't see where that offer comes from certainly not from a team that is any good and i see his situation danny playing out very similarly to the way that andre guadalas did last year where he's fielding offers for the mini mid-level and the full mid-level and then maybe you know the kings jump in there with the you know 50 million dollars guaranteed or something like that but a place he doesn't really want to go and so he's just like trying to find some way to create leverage with houston where he just wants to stay and who has full bird rights on him but also has tax concerns yeah i pretty much see it the same way and that is the challenge of having a lot of capped out teams is that he loses leverage and maybe he can try to manufacture it and houston hasn't had the success that the Warriors had when they when Iguodal was on the market, but they have lofty aspirations. And of course, if Chris Paul has already come back, then he gains leverage just because they can't lose him. And that also ties in with Mbamute, you know, whether he goes or, or returns. And I mean, we saw how important Trevor Reza was to the Rockets during that series, even in the portions where he was in foul trouble and their defense just got so much weaker because he was their best defender on KD. Zach Lowe reporting that a league memo has stated that the end of the one and done era could occur as early as 2021 or 2022 draft and i think this is most important just for planning purposes because you'll remember that 2006 draft was a very weak one because you 2005 you had that high school class had been cannibalized already by players who were able to going into the NBA. It was actually kind of a weak high school class. Anyway, there weren't any great 2005 high school guys. And then 2006, what would have been Greg Oden and Kevin Durant, Thad Young, etc., got pushed back to 2007. And so you just were missing. I mean, imagine what this draft would look like, for example, Danny, if none of the one and dones were in it, right? Like that would be a pretty, pretty ugly draft, right? So now you're getting the exact opposite and whether it's 2021 whether it's 2022 of you're gonna have a draft that's like doubly strong you'll have all the one and done guys who couldn't go in as high schoolers and then you'll have that high school class also that's gonna be an awesome draft so whatever year that is picks in that year should be very valuable once it's determined which year that is exactly now they're really as late as 2021 i think there are very few first rounders that are actually out there that late i mean there's the grizzlies pick could be unprotected in 2021 there's uh miami's 2021 unprotected first rounder from the gordon Dragic trade i think that's it as far as picks that are out there going that late uh, uh, the clippers pick i think that they owe to the celtics is lottery protected that could go as far as that year if it rolls over three years in a row that's about it though i think yeah that sounds about right and i want to make the basic point of thank goodness because i've i've been mean, i've the high school kids just should be able to go in and so anything that gets in that direction even if it takes a little longer i'm, I'm ready for it and i will just mention this just so it's out there theoretically if he is good enough that could get lebron james jr into the nba a year earlier and that would be you know that whole dynamic which i've 
talked about it on Real Jam Radio if you want to hear it. I think Ben Golliver and I talked about it a month month or two ago. You can file it away. Oh, and by the way, yeah, that Clippers pick is only lotto protected for two years, 19 and 20, and then it becomes uh, a second rounder. Yeah. Uh, also, one other correction I got to make with Mo Bamba. For some reason, I had in my head that he was 6'10". He's actually a 6'11", a little over 6'11 in socks, and I think in shoes, like 7'1 and a half. Seven, or, I'm sorry, 7'5", seven 7'3". Foot seven foot so uh, I had the high, the standing reach and the wingspan right, but uh had that wrong about him. And then also Texas's defense, You know, I, I know that they're 52nd in the nation. Probably not the greatest stat to use because it wasn't schedule adjusted, and so some of the other the schedule adjusted metrics like their defense a, a lot more. Oh, I want to mention one small thing too. There is another pick that has a 2021 element to it, and that I'm it might convey before that. But Memphis's pick that they owe to Boston. Yeah, it's I said that one. Eight, top eight protected next. Yeah. Oh, you did. I missed it. I uh, I mean, I think it's going to convey before that. But that w- imagine if that's what happens. Holy crap! Yeah, we'll see where Memphis is at that point. This number four pick that they're about to. They're have. a 50 win team, Nate. We already know that. <laughs> uh. All right, that'll do it for today. Thanks so much for listening. And we're going to be back tomorrow. We're going to do Jaron Jackson tomorrow and uh, another offseason outlook as well. So we'll be back then.